And here we are at the beautiful old Millbrook School, which has been turned into a community policing office, a library, and a general meeting facility. And we're here tonight to do a transition town video uh, for planting your seeds indoors to start them early. What a beautiful day. Look at that. That's a prey. Anyway, come on, let's go in. about starting seeds right now. Um, and I also run my own small company called Urban Tomato, um, which is an heirloom seed business. So I save all my own seeds for that, and because of that, I also start a ton of my own seeds. So I have lots of things growing in my apartment right now. I brought a few um, of the seedlings that I started a few weeks ago along just to sort of show how things grow. Um, I have some kale and some lettuce and arugula, and then these are a lovely flower called Cosmos. Um, I brought those. I have tons of tomatoes growing, but um, they're pretty sensitive to the cold. So even though it's nice inside, I didn't want to bring them with me. So they're a little bit thicker and nicer looking, but I thought I'd bring those just to inspire that we're not just looking at dirt for this evening. <laughs> um, so is there anyone that needs a hand out? You guys just came in and give you some of these. Um, so for the Community Garden Network, we do a lot of community development work. Um, of which means I don't always just stand up in front of groups and talk, although I do do it more and more often. Um, but I am more than happy to have anyone interrupt me with questions at any point. Um, so don't feel, if you don't understand anything, or you think, oh my gosh, I don't do it that way, or my grandma never did it that way, that's fine. Feel free to stop me and sort of interject. And of course, we'll have times for other questions at the end. Um, so what I'm going to do is basically just kind of go through this handout, kind of like the steps. And again, of course, please interrupt me um, as we go. I also included uh, this chart, and it's sort of related to step two, so I will sort of go into that in a little bit when we get to that. Um, so the very first thing that is incredibly important is to buy good seeds. Now, as I said, I run an heirloom seed company, so I'm slightly biased towards heirloom seeds, but that's not the only kind you could buy. Um, but if you're buying seed that is fresh, you're going to get a lot higher success rate. Um, often if you're buying heirloom seeds, they have been collected quite recently, probably the fall of the past year or a couple years. Um, and they've also probably been germination tested, which means they've tested to see how many of them are going to spread. So that's going to kind of save you some time if you don't want to spend a whole amount of time planting all your seeds, getting everything ready, and then three weeks later realize nothing sprouted or one out of six sprouted. So it's certainly worthwhile. It's tempting when you go into the dollar store, like, look at that huge rack of seeds, and they're all a dollar. There's a reason why they're only a dollar. So I would say, you know, without a doubt, it's great to buy good quality seed. Um, that being said, you can also swap seeds with people, just as long as you're looking for a sort of freshly harvested seed. Um, tomato seeds can last up till 10 years, but I personally would never sell seed that's older than three years. So just sort of gauges to live by. Um, I know like right now at Home Hardware, Canadian Tire, they do have a huge selection, so I wouldn't necessarily put that in the dollar store category, but you still kind of want to look for, for companies. And if you're buying heirloom seed, although it is becoming a bit of a catchphrase these days, um, you're probably going to have greater success rates. So that's, that's my spiel on heirloom seeds. <laughs> um, so the next question is what to start indoors and when? And I think this is Probably one of the things I see a lot of my customers have a lot of questions about. So I printed out this chart. Um, 
And you can actually go online. There's a link at the bottom of it if you want to look at it. But this little box at the top, you can fill in what is your last frost date. So I got ambitious and I said May 2 4 weekend, and I'm really hoping that that's true. <laughs> this year it may not be. Um, but basically, a lot of the time you ask for that because you're counting backwards from that for the amount of time that your crops are going to need. Um, so there's sort of different categories of things you need to think about. The very first things you want to start are onions. And I would say at this point we're a little bit past the time you need to start onion for seeds. Usually they say eight weeks, so I'm hoping we can be in our gardens in eight weeks. Again, feeling ambitious. Um, but right now we're kind of at the stage of peppers and tomatoes. We're kind of bridging on almost getting too late, but if you get them in soon you can do it. So that's usually six to eight weeks before your last frost. Um, same in that category are brassicas, so that would be your cauliflower, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, um, eggplants, peppers, tomatoes. And the reason for that is you can kind of picture the plant, is that when you're growing it, it's going to take a long time to not only get to be a good sized plant, but then the plant still has to produce fruit as well. So in our climate, there's not necessarily the length of time it would take if you just put a tomato seed in the ground on May 2 4 weekend. Not as likely that you're going to get the fruit off that. So you can think about it sort of that way, like picturing what's going to grow. You know, broccoli, you're not usually getting it until September anyway, so if you didn't give it that head start, you're kind of just behind on it a little bit. And then the next stage is things like cucumbers, squash, zucchinis, melons, and those are sort of one of two. You could start them two to three weeks ahead of time inside, or sometimes people direct sow them in the garden. So that sort of varies depending if you want to, you can start them ahead of time, but you don't have to. Um, and then there are things that you don't want to start ahead of time, and a lot of those are root crops. So you want to put your beets and your carrots and any of your greens right into the ground. Um, that being said, you can start some greens ahead of time if I have here because you can't eat them inside. Um, but when, again, when you're thinking about that, you know, the greens, some of your herbs, you're just eating the leaf. So the amount of time you need it to get to produce a leaf is quite a bit less than if you're waiting for the plant to produce the entire fruit. So that's why you sort of have these different timings. Um, and a lot of time what I've seen now is people will start too early, and there is a danger in that as well. I have customers say to me, I had seeds left over from you last year and I got anxious, so I planted them in January. Actually not that great of a plan, because one, we see the light changing so much right now, and I see my <coughs> seeds responding to that dramatically. If I had started these greens in January, they would have taken a long time to sprout, they wouldn't look really great. Whereas I started these two weeks ago, and they came right up. Three days, they were, you know, you could tell that they knew spring was coming. So that's important. The light is really big for seeds. And also, you don't want them to get giant. You really actually aren't getting value out of your plant if you have a giant tomato covered in flowers. It's going to get shocked when you go to put it in the ground. And so that's actually not making it happy. Um, I know sometimes you see at home hardware again, tomatoes already have the fruit on them. You're not actually getting a better bargain for your plant. That fruit is not very likely to actually produce a delicious tasting fruit. So you're actually better off if they're small and healthy. Therefore, you don't want to get things going massively ahead of time. Um, also, they'll get root bound. So quite often you'll put them in a pot like this eventually and they're going to outgrow that if you started it in January. So as tempting as it is, it's good to follow by those sort of guidelines because you could end up just being sort of disappointed otherwise. Does that make sense to people? Um, other things, potatoes, garlic, lots of root crops you could just put right in the ground as well. Um, the one exception of the herb is I've also often found basil is a good thing to give a head start, even a month ahead of time, because then you're going to have nice, healthy looking, leafy plants that you can put into the ground. But you can direct sow them if you want. Um, so, another really, really important factor is soil. Um, so it's a little bit misleading for me to call it that because you actually want to use something called a soilless medium. So basically, I think I can pass this around if people want, but a lot of people have probably seen this. Um, you can make your own if you want, but you can get them at most hardware stores right now. So it contains peat um, and something called uh, vermiculite, which looks a little bit like styrofoam. And the reason for using these is that it's really porous and light. 
So your little seedlings can push their way through it and it's much easier if you sort of load them full of compost or what you think is really nutrient rich soil, it's, it's not good for them. A seed has everything in it it needs to grow. It comes with its own little food. It's kind of like a baby, I guess. So you don't need to be feeding it extra as a little tiny thing. But you do need airflow and you do need it to be able to breathe in here a little bit. So um, it's often called soilless medium or seed starting mix. And again, get that at home hardware, those kind of places right now. Um, again, this is my own warning, but not necessary, is that the terms organic doesn't really mean anything in the seed world. So when you go to Canadian Tire now, you often see organic right next to the Miracle Bowl logo. That's a lie, as far as I'm concerned. There's absolutely nothing organic about Miracle Grow. In fact, if you read the label, it says don't use near an open water source. So I don't really want that in my food. Um, but that is up to you guys, of course. But just read carefully, because I find now five out of seven types of soilless medium have either Miracle Grow or Scots written on it, and also will say organic in big flashy letters. So it's more than a bit misleading, that's for sure. What brands would you recommend? Um, I found this one at Canadian Tire, and it seems to be pretty good. It's just called Promix. Um, and often they're kind of generic names like that, um, but you'll see the logos fairly prominently displayed, and Miracle Grow is the most common one that I've seen. And again, you know, you're not like poisoning your children if you put that in it, but it's food that the plant doesn't really need, and it is a whole lot of extra chemicals. So, and often it's more expensive too, like sometimes it's twice the amount per bag. I think this bag was four something, but he had to dig it out of a snow bag for me, so <laughs> I bought this in February. So. Um, so yeah, you look for these kind of things and then we'll talk about transplanting later, but when you go to transplant, that's when you can add compost or your worm compost or your fertilizers or anything like that, but you don't need it to start here. Um, and online there is lots of websites that teach you how to make your own if you'd rather just sort of buy the ingredients and do that. I personally don't to save myself time and energy, but it's up to you. Um, so the next kind of thing is containers. And I often use these because they're reusable, not too difficult to find. I'm in the lucky position now where people sometimes call me and they're like, oh, I just cleaned out my grandpa's shed and you had all these seed starting things, so you want them? I'm like, okay, sure. Um, but you can use almost anything. Like I brought this book along because it's got this cool idea of using it in old eggshells, which is neat, you know, especially if you're doing kids or all those kind of things. Um, some people use the actual egg cartons fine too. Um, some people will use like recycled uh, sour cream containers. Any of those things are fine, just the most important part is drainage. So you can kind of see, you can see through this, you can see light coming through it. That's really important because it's going to allow the water to kind of seep through so that you're not having it sitting all in the bottom. Um, and it's going to give you a little bit of airflow and breathing room for the plants. So if you used um, old sour cream containers, just sort of in the bottom. Um, if you're using eggshells or cardboard, it's not as concerned because water will actually seep through that. So you do have a little bit of leeway when it comes to those. Um, and then the other thing is clean. So particularly if someone just gave them to you or you just find them somewhere, you want to wash them. I would use soap, a little bit of bleach if you're uh, okay with using that. And that is because bugs can live on these. So if people kept them somewhere that was somewhat warm that wouldn't have killed off those bugs, they could be living in here, and then as soon as you put soil in and your plants start growing, then boom! What just happened to my plants? I don't know, they're covered in bugs. I don't know where those bugs came from. So that can happen, and particularly if you're boring someone else's greenhouse, they're not going to be very happy with you if you do something like that. So give them a wash. You know, often I'll even just kind of spray them with soapy water and rinse them down. I usually keep mine in a really cool shed, so I'm hoping that means most things are killed over the winter. But some people I know don't do that, but it's, it's a problem. Um, but definitely drainage is, is the most important thing. Um, does anyone else use any other containers that I didn't mention? I was just wondering, um, sorry, is it, are you only supposed to No, you don't interrupt me anytime, that's fine. Well, I'm not interrupting, but ask away. Yeah, okay, cool. Um, I was wondering if there's any types of containers that uh, would be bad, like uh, would leach into the soil or something, like styrofoam? I don't know, styrofoam right. okay? Um, I mean, I think some of that would be a bit 
a, your personal choice. Like I think some people would say not to use plastic because it could potentially have some leaking coming from some of those containers. Same with styrofoam. Yeah. Um, but I mean, this is sort of a common gray plastic to use, and I don't yeah. know if it causes major problems. The other thing is, you know, they're only living in here for probably a month or a bit more, so yeah. depending on how stringent you want to be about that. I mean, that's kind of why I suggested egg cartons or eggshells, because if you really want to make sure you're avoiding those things, there are other yeah. options. Um, I used one year, like, reusable beer cups from the dollar store. <laughs> I don't know if there was something weird about them or not, but I did notice a significant difference in what grew in them compared to, like, if I was doing a high school science experiment, it would have come up, don't use those again. Why? I don't know. <laughs> but it's interesting. Yeah? I've been saving Tim Hortons cups. Are they okay? They've got totally. a little wax inside them. I, don't, I think, is there, they're cardboard, but they do have a plasticky inside, or is that okay? Oh yeah, that's fine. Yeah, I mean, if you find, like, you're starting to notice that they would get, um, you can almost smell it a bit, or if you don't see water coming out the bottom, you might want to just poke a small yeah. hole in them. That's a good one. I have used old coffee yeah. cups before, for sure. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing, is if you have something you can reuse, you, you can definitely do it. Um, just drainage and cleanliness are sort of your friends when it comes to this. Um, so the next part is sort of the fun part, seeding. Um, and what I usually do is kind of try to get all your materials together, gather things. Um, and some of my favorite things to have are, I use another sort of bucket. And the reason is I pour the soil in and then I add water and mix it up. Um, and the reason why I do that is because if you sort of pour water in afterwards, you can see it kind of sitting on the surface. It's not necessarily evenly distributed, whereas if you do it in here, you're getting nice, even, moist soil. And it kind of reduces a little bit of the mass, although inevitably there's a bit of dirt because you're using dirt. Um, you could, you know, just pour it on top of here, and that's okay too, but I find it easier to do this. And I actually found that this soil is a little bit moist to start with. I don't know why. Maybe because I started out with snow picks somehow, but... Um, so I'm not going to add too much water to this because it is already um, nice and moist. But I'll pass this around if anybody wants to get their hands in the dirt or feel what it feels like if you haven't used it before. Um, and then I usually try to like, I was getting towards the very end of what I had left in my house. <laughs> so these are very uneven, but if you can get sort of an even tray. Um, I will also note that usually what you want to do is use a tray that has a solid bottom. But again, I started running out of those at my house, so I brought this one for demonstration. But <coughs> if you don't have a solid bottom, the water's going to work. What about the little domes, the plastic domes that you see on some of the trays? Right. Um, I actually used those for the first time this year, and I found them quite useful. Um, I have found my pepper seeds were taking over three weeks to germinate. I live in a hundred year old home and I'm using my dormer window so I can actually see them moving in those very cold days. So those, those helped quite a bit. And what those are going to do is just create your little greenhouse. So it's keeping the moisture in, it's keeping the warmth in. And but if you don't have, you don't need You don't good. No. I mean, I've seen some people even just use plastic wrap and like um, I want to keep it above a little bit so that you can have space to create that humidity. But you know, you can put chopsticks and stuff, but not required. No. So would you say, um, if you are using an actual greenhouse, maybe you shouldn't use those plastic things because it would be like too much humidity or something? Um, it depends on the warmth in your greenhouse. Yeah. I would say if your greenhouse is pretty warm and you have a heating source in there, it's probably not necessary. Okay. Um, it's not necessarily redundant, it's just maybe not required because mm -hmm. pretty much it's just creating a nice warm environment humidity. But again, if you're noticing things are germinating a bit slowly, then that could be a way of sort of speeding it up, definitely. Mostly I just found when things are really cold, it does kind of help with that, but I think it also sort of creates this like really healthy environment for things. Um, so basically, yeah, you just mix it up if you want. I brought this, although I'm not known to usually use the bowls. I'd rather just put my hands in the dirt, but it's up to you guys. Or you get kids to do it, and it's always helpful too. Um, so you just can kind of, I just put it down and then evenly kind of spread it out. Sorry, I hope there's a broom in here because I don't want to mess. <laughs> and you don't want to necessarily um, 
I kind of use the analogy of brown sugar. You don't want to do what they say in recipes where you pack the brown sugar pretty tightly. You just want to keep it, you know, nice, fluffy. You can flatten it out a little bit, but you don't need to push it down and try to put as much as you can. Just sort of let as much goes in there as will settle in naturally. And sometimes after you see, you could add a little bit more to top it up. But for now, you don't need it to be sort of really compact. And in fact, it's probably preferable that it isn't. I don't know if people can see that, but I just sort of fill it right up to, to the edge of it. Um, so yeah, just kind of fill that, and I usually do the, the whole tray at once. Um, and then just kind of create like a little bit of a divot for your seeds. So again, I usually use my fingers, and you can kind of just like press down a little space for them to grow in there. Um, depending what you're growing, you could plant them deeper or more to the surface. So the general rule is plant a seed twice as deep as it is big. So if you're planting something like these beans, um, which I didn't mention in the beginning, but these could probably go directly in the soil. You don't need to start them ahead of time. Um, then you kind of would be pushing it fairly deep into your soil. But if you're using something, say like these parsley seeds, they're super tiny. You're really just putting them right on the edge. And that's the same as tomatoes, peppers, any sort of small seed. Um, if you push them down too far, it may not eliminate the fact that they're sprouting, but you know, if you think of a seed that's super tiny and it has to climb three inches through the soil, it's going to have sort of a detriment against it to start with. So it's better just to keep it close to the surface. And then there's a few seeds that don't like to be covered. Most of those are flowers, and they'll usually stay that pretty openly on the seed package. Um, but sometimes poppies is an example. They kind of just like a little bit of light to germinate, whereas most other things they don't mind being in the dark, dark of the soil. Um, so I would say that an important point at this is labeling. Especially for me, as I said, I run an heirloom seed company that concentrates on tomatoes. So I have 60 different types of tomatoes growing in my house right now. And they look all the same. So if I mix them up, I would be very upset with myself. <laughs> that would be a year's worth of work kind of wasted. Um, so you can buy these. Someone gave these to me. Usually what I use is old vertical blinds. They work perfectly, super easy to come across. Just cut them up, use them again. If you're very organized and you plant the same things each year, you could reuse them. I usually end up crossing mine out, writing something else on, but again, it's up to you. Um, these, uh, were someone had purchased from a store. They're not cheap, so I would recommend using something else. I use um, yogurt containers, just a large plastic container. You just Great. Yeah, that's an excellent idea. I had a friend who used clothespins this year, which is actually looks really cool too. So you just kind of pinch it on the end and write on it what it is. So it really doesn't matter except for that um, popsicle sticks I've noticed tend to break down a little bit. But again, if you're sort of going to be not living in here for months and months, it's not that big of a deal. Um, and Sharpies also are very, very key ingredients. I have found those colored Sharpies Great, except for they wear off in the garden. So my mom one year bought me a pack of, you know, 16 different colored Sharpies, and I was really excited, and I had them all for my different colors of tomatoes, and then two weeks into the garden, I couldn't read the labels anymore. So I was like, okay, going back to black Sharpies. So I would say, you know, label each one of these. If you can, unless you plant the whole flat, the same thing, then that's okay, but, or if you're not concerned, don't worry about it, but it is always nice when you go to plant your garden that you kind of know what it is that you have planted. Um, you kind of see my little labels in here. So, And often I'll put a date on it too, because then you kind of think, oh my gosh, it seems like a long time has gone by and nothing's sprouting, or oh wow, those came up quick, I wonder when I planted them, so it can give you kind of a gauge of what um, timing that you're working with. Um, so I guess I'm going to plant some cilantro up here, I think. Easy for you guys to see. So, as you can see by my samples that I brought, that I do not listen to my own advice, but I will give it anyways. I would only plant one or two in each of these little cell packs. So, there's four in there. You could put one or two in each of the four. Um, the reason for that is that you can see these guys are already crowding each other out. And they're not all going to do super well. So unless I want to go home and transplant these tonight, I've put far too many in here. Um, so you're just going to have healthier plants if you're just sort of doing that from the beginning. Um, if you have older seed or you're not sure how good it is, you can 
put more in, but if you feel like it's pretty good quality seed, then it's not necessary to put more than one in each thing. Particularly with tomatoes and peppers that are going to get quite a bit bigger, it's just going to kind of save you the headache. Sometimes what people will do is think, okay, look, I have five seeds in here, this one looks healthiest, and take the other four out. I don't have a stomach for that, but some people do. It's up to you guys. <laughs> um, so if you literally just put the seed in, you know, one or two, as I said, and you can just drop it in lightly, especially if you have those little divots. Don't put it in the other ones like I have done there accidentally. Sometimes people use little teaspoons or things like that, but I don't usually do that. Um, and then if you have lots of soil, you can kind of just cover it back up. Or as I said, you know, at that point you can add a little bit more. But again, don't press it right down. Just um, leave it nice and light and fluffy. And I would suggest it's always good to do it right away because otherwise your phone rings and then you come back and you're like, oh, which ones did I buy? <laughs> you're digging through the soil trying to find seed or three weeks later like, I think we put something in that, but I don't know. So it's always, always a handy thing to do that for sure. Um, so I won't plant all of these, but if people want to try their hand at it, they're more than welcome to come up here and do a little sample planting. Um, so then once you've got these planted, um, as I said, most seeds don't need light to germinate. So if you have a really cold house or cold window cell, you don't need to put them in there right away. What I've done, I have radiators in my house, so I put the seeds on top of that until they germinate. And then you want to move them to the sunny location that you can find in here. So even you can see here, if these window sills were wired, I'd recommend putting them right on that. Because even if you're putting it here on a table, there's still that distance. Um, I know that not everybody has that, that option, um, but just sort of thought, because, you know, as you'll see, these guys, you can tell where the window was. They're growing towards the light. <laughs> and so if they're way over here, as opposed to close to that window, they're just going to have to reach even farther. And I'd say a pretty common complaint that people have is, let's see, they're too lanky. I don't know what I did. That's exactly what it's doing. They're reaching for the light. So there's a few things that you can do to kind of prevent that. What I do is I turn my flats every day. Don't have to do it every day, but that way now they're reaching back towards the sun, so they're getting a little bit stronger. So you can kind of just rotate them that way, and it, it does make a huge difference, I find. Um, the other thing that I sometimes do is put a fan on them. This is kind of mimicking uh, wind. Strengthens them up, moves them a little bit so that they're having to reach further for the light. Um, and also, uh, it kind of prevents like mold or the soil from getting too damp, um, so that's important. And on that note, the watering of seeds, I find more common that people overwater than underwater. You will see pretty easily when the soil gets dried out, um, it starts to go almost like a paler color of, of beige. Um, and your seedlings will often sort of kind of fall right over. So barring that you don't let that happen for several days, <laughs> it's okay. If you come in, you're like, oh my gosh, my seedlings are falling over. Quite often you water them, they'll come right back up. If they turn to a minute dust, you may want to plant some more seeds. But other than that, I would say if you're overwatering, they're gonna cause, can cause disease, molds, all those kind of things. Um, not not good for your plants. So one way to tell is um, again if you have sort of bottom to your tray. Just lift it up and see if the water's going through. If you see some sitting there, check a couple hours later. If it's still there, you probably added a bit too much water. So you want to make sure that your plants are like absorbing the water that you've given them. Some people will water from underneath. That will give you stronger roots. It'll kind of reach down towards that, but it's not necessary. Um, but you don't want to be soaking them by any means. Um, so the airflow is really good for that. And I don't know if anyone's ever had this happen, but what's called dampening off disease. So your seedlings look like this, they look great, they look really healthy. And you come in and you look at them and you're like, they're dead. What happened? My soil is really moist, things seem fine, and if you look closely there might be a slight like, bit of mold on the top of the soil. Um, and that's usually caused by too much water. Uh, so a fan can help huge amounts with that because it's moving things around and, and keeping things circulating. 
Um, making sure you don't have stale water sitting in the bottom of your containers for too long. In fact, it's a couple hours or even a day. That's not a big deal. Um, and then I've also heard that some people will add cinnamon or sprinkle it along the top because it's actually an antibacterial. So it won't hurt your plant at all, um, but it will sort of help prevent with some of those things. Yeah, it smells great. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> it's interesting with water and cinnamon on your hands at the same time. But What about grow lines? Yeah, grow lights are totally acceptable. Um, they're a bit of an investment, but if you happen to have some, they're really great. So I have a set that just sits on the table that only fits two trays in it. So I've been rotating some of my seedlings underneath it. Um, they're good because the plants are going to grow straight up, and it's pretty difficult to get anywhere in your house that they're growing straight up to sun, unless you have a greenhouse or a skylight of some type. So they work excellent for that. I've even heard you can get um, lights for desk lamps that work for plants, so if you just have a few things that you're growing and that light's already going to be on, then that's useful for that. Um, I usually try to, when I use grow lights, just mimic the natural sun cycle. So I often put some underneath before I go to work and then turn it off when I get home at five. It's not always valuable to leave your plants underneath 24 hours of light, even though you might see sort of quick growth, that's maybe not ideal conditions for them. Um, some people who are doing sort of all indoor hydroponic growing may have a different view. But I would usually just sort of use the same sort of light cycles that we have. And especially if you don't have a lot of light in your house, it is a good consideration because you will really notice. Like, my house just has a west facing window, but it's on the third floor, so it gets tons of light at this time of day, and that's working okay. But certainly, south facing window is dreamy, but it doesn't have to be that way. Jill, you said. You said you put them in the dark or so before they germinate or something? Um, um, well, just like they don't necessarily need light to germinate. So if you're finding that your windowsill is quite chilly, um, they do need warmth more than light. So if you put them, you know, on top of your fridge or on top of a radiator until they sprout, then they'll just sort of have nice warmer conditions. Once they sprout, they're likely to kind of adapt to those chilly conditions, so it's okay. But as I said, with my peppers, they were not going to germinate. So they did not like that temperature, so I put them on top of my radiator underneath one of those domes. They sprouted and then now they're in the window. So. But you want to move them pretty quickly, like you want to keep an eye on it, because they wouldn't want to sprout and then have two days without light. That wouldn't be ideal for them. Again, a couple hours. It's not like you have to sit there and watch them come up and then move them or anything, but they, uh, yeah, they don't mind darkness to germinate. There are a few exceptions, but the large majority of seeds you will be fine with that. Um, so does that make sense to people? There's steps. I just have a question about watering. Um, sure. You know how you said, um, like you should check the tray to see if there's excess water underneath, and if it hasn't been absorbed within a few hours, maybe you overwater. But what if you um, are watering the tray and not watering from, like not watering from above? Right. Wouldn't that take longer to? Yeah, it might. I mean, maybe a few hours is a bit too specific. Probably even just a day. It's yeah. fine. Okay. I mean, again, you know, if you're not noticing any sort of problem with your seedlings, it might not be a big deal. But if you do notice, like, oh, they're looking like maybe there's some mold forming yeah. or something's not right, that that could be a way of checking it. Um, or, you know, if there's somewhere that, well, you were mentioning, you have to travel to your greenhouse. So yeah. sometimes you might overwater on purpose. Or I have some in my office yeah. window when people are green up, so I soak them on Friday night, yeah. knowing I'm not likely to be back in until Monday. So you can, you know, it's not as if they're going to be like, ah, too much water, dying under right now. But consistently, you don't want to sort of soak them every single day. And, uh, and as they get bigger, it is advisable to water them from underneath. You don't have to, but I would say certainly as they get a little bigger, even just water right on the soil surface as opposed to on top of the plant. Yeah. They can get molds on it and stuff that way. But if you have the option to water from underneath, that's, they're probably going to learn about that. So. But yeah, no, it doesn't have to be a couple hours. It's more like a day. <laughs> okay. um, so I would say, you know, depending on weather conditions, warmth, all those kind of things, Anywhere from three days to two to three weeks, you will see germination. Um, so greens, pretty quick. Like, you know, these were coming up in less than a week. My tomatoes, almost like clockwork, are one week. I've been doing it on Sunday afternoon. Next Sunday afternoon, they're there. Um, peppers, not as much. I had some I planted on March 16th, but I'm still seeing some come up. So it's, it's Definitely, they are feeling the same way we are about this winter, that it's taking longer. Um, a lot of times, seed packages will say on it, too, you know, if some flowers, it could be a couple months. The average is seven to ten days. 
So if you don't see anything in 10 days, you haven't necessarily done something wrong. But um, if you see several come up, you probably might have a few come up later, but the large majority of them are going to come up within a couple days. Yeah. Uh, what about pre-soaking seeds? Um, yeah, some people definitely do that for some of the bigger seeds. So say peas, I've heard it's really valuable for. Uh, some beans. Um, I've heard okra, it's almost necessary for. Um, so some of the seeds that have really thick seed coats to them. Basically, they're just going to kind of swell up with that water, and then when you put them in the soil, they're that much closer to being able to germinate. So some of those be are seeds with really thick coats, like peas. Um, they may not get that amount of moisture that they need, or it might take longer. I have never done it with my tomatoes or peppers or anything like that, but you can sometimes see them on the surface of the soil quite swollen, and I think that's sort of the stage before they burst. So I would find it difficult to do with some of the small seeds, but definitely with some of the bigger ones, that, that can be quite helpful and speed it up. Um, are you, uh, what do you think about pre-sprouting? Is that something you do? Um, I don't very much, like I do germination tests sometimes, which means I take sort of old seed and I put it in a plastic bag with a wet paper towel just to sort of see, okay, if I sell this to you, are you going to get great results from this? Mm -hmm. um, so sometimes, like, oh my gosh, these did so good, I should move them from that paper towel and plant them, but yeah. um, you could do that, but I think you're kind of pre-spreading them in a way by doing this, but mm -hmm. um, depending on space and stuff, yeah. Like you mean with peas or just with? Uh, just with uh, plants, I wasn't really aware like that different things would be specifically good for pre-sprouting. I just like have put a few things in plastic bags with like damp paper towel, and uh, I'm just I don't know, I'm just wondering. It's kind of an experiment, right. so I'm just wondering. If you think it's good. Yeah, I mean, I usually do that for germination testing, but I don't usually do it for planting. But I mean, again, if it's if it works for you, then that's totally fine, it's just sort of one more step that you're going to have to go through. Yeah. And in a way, if you're using that plastic cage in moist soil, that's actually acting quite similar to that plastic bag. Um, mm -hmm. So you're kind of using the same principles, but you're going to have to actually pull them out of that paper towel and put that, them in another pot. That's great if you want to just sprout things for, for the sprouts. Yes. You're in a clean, yeah. clean medium, and you can just use them as is. Right, yeah. Yeah, so for yeah. eating, that's a great way of doing mm -hmm. it. Yeah. And again, you know, if like at CD Sunday you picked up a pile of seeds on the table and you don't want to go through all of this, but you want to be sure they're viable, then you can do that definitely as well. Or in your garden, you know, you've had set out, but you have this one tiny space for peas and you don't want to put them all in and have to wait three, two weeks to see if they're actually going to mm -hmm. sprout. Um, but just because I haven't done a lot doesn't mean it's uh, not a good way of doing it. I just, that's not how I usually do it, but that's more than, you know, doesn't mean there's anything wrong. Um, so then your seeds are going to grow along pretty happily, just take them, care of them like this for a little while. Um, you know, you can see mine are getting fairly laggy, mostly because I have too many in here, but also just because of the light conditions. So sometimes I will actually just like push them into the soil a little bit. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with doing that. Be a little bit careful so you don't break them, but they're, they're hardier than you think. Um, but basically, these are like their beginning sprouting leaves. And then soon after that, they're going to get what is called a true leaf. So tomatoes, for example, that's when you can kind of start to smell that tomato smell. Um, when you get the leaf that looks like a real plant, uh, like you can see on here, these are the beginning leaves. And then in the middle, there's kind of this is a squash. I kind of see the little squash leaf in there. So those true leaves mean you can transplant at any time. You don't have to do it as soon as you get that true leaf, but that's sort of a, a marker. So I have my tomatoes that I started on March 16th are just getting their true leaves now. So they smell incredible when I water them. I'm like, oh, good. I hate that smell come September, but right now I love it. So, so at that point, that's when you can start separating them out into bigger pots. Again, you don't have to, but if you're finding, oh, I used to water them once every three days, now I have to water them every couple hours, they're outgrowing their pot. If you start to see, you know, a lot of roots coming out of the bottom, they're, they're ready for a new home. They're really bent over all the time. You know, they'll start to show signs of that. Again, if you actually followed my advice as I didn't and put one or two in each of these, they're not going to be nearly as crowded out and they will live longer in these pots. Um, so when you go to transplant, I usually put them in a four inch pot. Um, but again, you can use various things you have available to you. 
But you do want to go up a bigger size. You know, you can see it's quite a bit different, quite a big difference between the one and the four inch size, but it's worth it. Um, the light conditions are getting stronger, it's getting warmer, and those plants want to grow. So as soon as you put them in the bigger pot, they're going to take off. Um, so again, same principle. You know, I usually pre-moisten my soil. And depending on the size of the plant, I tend to put a bit of soil in here to start with. If it's a huge plant already, you can put it in and then kind of pack the soil around. Um, and I've had some mentors in life that taught me not to baby my little seedlings as much as I used to, but um, they are a little bit wimpy, but not too bad. So if you actually just like kind of put your finger in on the side and pull them out, then you can kind of grasp them that way. Um, and then especially if there's several in here, you want to rip them apart. You might hear or feel their roots ripping. It's okay. We haven't heard them. <laughs> In fact, you know, just from part, and still like that. Um, and then, most of the time, you can just bury this whole stem. Because that's what's making it like. You don't necessarily want to encourage more of that. Um, tomatoes, in particular, their roots grow out of their stems. So, bury them away. Bury them as deep as you want, as long as there's a little bit of leaf coming out. The rest of stuff, you want to keep that leaf coming out. So this is a bit too early for me to be doing this to this little plant, but it's just for example. So you put it in, and then I just press it right down so that then you can just kind of see a little bit of the leaf sticking out on top. I'm going to put a couple in here because these are kale so the plants don't get gigantic. Um, but if you're, again, you're doing tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, okra, squash or anything, one per each of these is more than enough. And literally within two weeks you'll probably see it double in size. It kind of shoots up once you give it more space. And I've had plants that didn't have room to transplant versus those, and they're a third of the size. So you can dramatically see that they like a new home. Um, and at this point, this is when you could add compost, worm castings, various number of things, because the plant is going to like a little bit more uh, nutrition. At CD Sunday, I got this from one of the farmers. It's a uh, compost tea. So this year we made in these handy bags, but some people can make it anyway. So boys, basically you just boil it and then you can add it to water to dilute it. So then you can kind of feed all of your plants that way. So for me, again, I live in an apartment building. Not very convenient to get compost or manure, so this is very handy. But if you have a backyard compost and you want to just scoop out a little bit from the bottom, barring it's not still frozen, um, then that's, and that's an excellent way of doing it. Um, if you live on a farm and you have access to manure, you could use it, but it doesn't necessarily need anything that strong at this point in time. Um, so yeah, about a month to transplant, like from your early seed to transplant, but just watch for those second leaves is kind of the, the good tip. Um, and then you want to just sort of keep them in those pots again in the sunny location as you possibly can. Same things, airflow, very important. Um, and depending on the, the crop, is going to depend when you put them outside. So there are some things that are a little bit hardier, like some of the greens. Um, mostly just the greens are hardy in terms of things you would transplant. Um, and other than that, you want to make sure all danger of frost is passed to even start thinking about putting tomatoes, peppers, basil. I go well beyond a frost warning. I want it to feel nice outside at night because if you put your plants out too early and it's cold, it'll shock them, it'll stunt them, and you spend some months babying them, and then one night they can be killed, and that's kind of disappointing. Whereas if you have a healthy, strong squat plant and then put it outside, it's going to take off as soon as those conditions are ready. Um, that being said, there is a middle stage that I call hardening off. Well, most people do, not just me. Um, so, you know, living in this nice, Great environment, windowsill, greenhouse, you're happy, healthy, and then you're like, oh, awesome, it's 28 degrees outside today, I'm putting my plants outside, so put them right in the middle of a sunny garden, it's noon, they're not going to be very happy with you, <laughs> because that's quite a shock, so what you actually want to do is gradually sort of get them used to it, so what I do is say you have a porch, you know, start with morning sun, dappled sun, let them sort of adapt to that. Same being with cold, you know, you want to sort of let them merge into that. Um, but what I found over the years, last several years, is that UV is very strong and your plants will get sunburnt. So they will get white dots on them and they can actually even die. 
So it's better if you sort of, again, let them be healthy and strong and sort of gradually adapt them to those <coughs> conditions. Um, as much as you want to put everything on the ground all at once, you won't be very happy if they just sort of get really shocked and don't look good. So, yeah. Um, you put them out in the morning, in the morning sun, but then you bring them in again? Right? Yeah, I was going to take them out and bring them in a couple times. I mean, you don't have to do it ten times or anything like that, but just sort of... I have found more so with sun than cold, even. It used to be always hardening them off for the cold nights, so people will kind of leave them in the evening out of the sun and sort of make sure they adapt to that. Um, but now I really find it for the sun. So I would start with morning or late afternoon sun and then sort of gradually introduce them. And I often, before I put mine in the garden, have had them out in midday sun as well, especially if your garden is full of bright sun. Um, and again, you know, they just have that healthy, Bigger to them, once you put them in the ground, they're going to be so much happier. And when you go to put them in the ground again, you, if they've gotten leggy again, you can bury that part, especially with tomatoes, you can bury them quite deeply. Um, this isn't really about seed starting, but I usually do something called packing them a lunch. So I take the hole and then put a handful of compost, a pile of water, and the plant, and then cover it. So I'm just sending them off on their way. Now, if your soil is super rich anyways, you don't need to worry about that as much. Um, but it's kind of similar principle as when you're transplanting them, you know, give them a little bit of food, give them that sort of head start, um, and then they're tougher. Um, but I would say, you know, there are eight steps here. It sounds a bit complicated, but in the end, those seeds have it programmed in them that they want to grow. So if you put them in soil, they're more than likely to sprout, they're more than likely to grow, you're more than likely to have success. These are just sort of, for over the years, I've heard of many things people have told me that have happened doesn't mean if you don't do everything perfectly, you're guaranteed to have these things happen by any means. I've just sort of had lots of customers tell me varying scenarios, so try to cover them all. Um, and I will say that the fan is actually really huge, especially um, I've had plants, you know, if you have an open garden, you don't want them going outside never experiencing wind because it's a very safe environment in a window still, and they're going to have huge gusts of wind. And so. I brought seedlings down to the Saturday farmer's market to sell before I feel like I want to stand around them like this because there's just gusts of wind coming through and it's cold and I haven't really had a chance to harden them off yet and so they do look a little bit of protection but um, they're also not as weak as you think so you can kind of rip them apart, pop them in other pots and if one of them breaks or isn't really doing that well it's probably not that strong of a plant to start with and so it's not a huge loss I mean. If it's already eight weeks old, you might be pretty sad. <laughs> but at the little seedling stage, if it cracks easily, that's you know not the hardiest plant that you had to start with. So especially if you overseeded like I have. Yeah. Um, I have one of those little plastic greenhouses that's just like basically a plastic bag over yep. some racks. How did, would that factor into this business? Um, those are great. Like you're basically just creating a nice humid environment, and actually I've been using one of those inside oh. because it's cold in yeah. there. So yeah. um, it's you know going to protect them. I wouldn't necessarily in this temperature yeah. put it outside with tomatoes and things like that. Although certainly for hardening off, it can help with that. Um, once it's a little bit warmer, like that's going to be a bit of frost protection, a bit of wind protection, and it actually does heat up quite a bit there yeah. compared to just being right outside. So, especially once it gets a little bit warmer, you can kind of, even during days, put things out in there that okay. are going to be a little bit more protected. Yeah. Okay. And as the season gets warmer, and, you know, I, if you have a frost warning, I wouldn't leave tomatoes outside even in that. But if it's just kind of a bit of a chillier night, it will mm -hmm. hold some of that heat in that. So, okay. they are very useful. Okay. Good space saver. Yes. Too. Yes. And it'll create, like, a nice humidity in there, yeah. too. Like, I have a friend who uses that inside, too, and she has a force air view, oh. and she puts it right in for the head, oh. so it's actually creating this like really nice yes. little warm environment, and her seeds just come up oh. really quickly. So, okay. Yeah. Doesn't work so much with the radiator, you didn't want to put the plastic right up against it, but you know, it depends on your conditions, definitely. I had tomato seeds last year that I planted, a variety of cherries yeah. up to beef steak. And they all took off, they germinated great, and they grew about that far, and then they stopped. Just stopped growing? They stopped. But they didn't die, they just they stopped continuing to grow. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I didn't try to harden them off, but I, I couldn't figure out why they wouldn't keep growing. I guess so you put them outside and they didn't grow? 
No, well, I tried to harden them off. Right, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I think I had um, given why? away those and they... But why would they have stopped? So it's interesting when I'm hearing you say that you plant them six to eight weeks and that's exactly what I did last year. Right. They came up, everything was going great, and then they just stopped Stop. growing. Uh, did you put them in different soil at that point? or No, no? they were still in the little pot. Okay. Pie. So my guess, although that is a bit strange without a doubt, is that they could use some food. So yeah, like weird. Yeah, leaf compost or something. I think old issues. So I've actually gone and bought a, a little heat mat that you can put on yeah. your tray. So certainly they can become stunted from getting cold. It is a bit rare that they would have just totally so your stopped tomatoes, growing. Do you ever see the, the stem actually get purpley colored? Yes, that will That's happen normal. for sure. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, it's definitely. Um, a, I think, and I could be wrong. I think it's a sign that you might want a bit more food in your soil, hmm. um, but it doesn't mean that they're going to die. Or like I've seen that happen plenty of times for sure. Um, it's not always the like big marker of a really healthy plant, but it doesn't mean it's super unhealthy either. Um, if, if, I hope that doesn't happen to you again, but if it does, I would recommend putting them in another pot and adding some, some compost or those yeah. kind of things. It's all new soil, maybe I should try a different soil. Yeah, and I mean, there are some different, like, um, leaf compost is great, but it's full of nitrogen mm -hmm. that helps build leaves. So that's great, but you might end up getting a super bushy plant and not a lot of fruit. So you just kind of factor a little bit of different so types of things. So at six to eight weeks, roughly how, what size are they? Um, I would say, you know, they're wow. kind of like, wow. um, they're seedlings, like they're still fitting in this pot, mm -hmm. although undoubtedly so starting to grow out a little bit. Right. And, wow. Yeah, I mean, some of them could only be like that. Again, it really makes a difference at what point you transplant. Like I can see it almost night and day, the differences between my ones that I've had time to transplant and how much bigger they get than the ones that are still living in here. Um, but something like compost tea or something might help because then you know you don't necessarily have a lot of space in your so I'm wondering if they sort of used up their natural nutrients and then kind of needed something else. Yeah, because I mean I find like cold is certainly an issue, but I like to think I'm almost hardening them off inside my house. Mm -hmm. Because if they're already growing, then unless it dips down to minus 30 tonight, then it shouldn't. But it could stump them a little bit, certainly. So, like I've had people say, oh, it's gorgeous, May 17th, I planted my tomatoes. <laughs> Did you now? <laughs> it's great. And they're like, so if they die, I'll just get more seedlings from you. I'm like, you know, I have limited amounts, right? But, um, but they may not die if you don't have a frost, but that certainly could stunt them, particularly with peppers and things. I find tomatoes are a little bit hardier, which is hard. Not that I don't believe you. I just, uh, I'm not sure I know the exact answer for that one, but I would say try transplanting them again, give them a little bit of food. Try to create a sort of warm, sheltered environment if you can. Sometimes people even use that sort of row cover. Um, just kind of creates a nice, like, even warmer, and it can, if you have a frost, a light frost, it can kind of stop it. Mm -hmm. so. What's the best way to store seeds through winter, through the winter, like through the year? I, I somewhere I read that you should put them, you could put them in a refrigerator in a sealed container. But they should be as long as they don't get uh, wet. Right. Yeah. Um, you can. Usually, what I say is dark, cool, dry. Yeah. So the opposite of what I've advised here for seeding. Right. Um, if you know you have your grandfather's precious seed and you're going away out of the country for two years, put it in the freezer. Right. Otherwise, I wouldn't worry about it, um, especially if you're using fresh seed, it should last. Um, the exceptions being leeks, which often only last a year, onions as well. Okay. Um, but as long as you're keeping it somewhere dark, cool, dry, they should last. Like as I said, I've had tomato seeds that are 10 years old that I'm still getting germination from. I have three-year-old seed that I'm getting 100% germination. Um, but definitely, you know, avoid the heating source as far as ways you can get it. A cupboard that closes is key. You don't really want sunlight on it, um, and certainly you don't want water pouring on it. Um, but a freezer is not necessary. Like I know some people that do that, but. Right, does anyone else have any other questions? I guess I should have asked at the beginning, but has everyone here started seeds before, or is anyone brand new to it? Yeah. Okay. Has anyone had anything um, weird or wonderful that happened that they didn't know what had happened? Or? I normally end up with 
very, like, less than half of my sugar on, but I didn't know about putting them in the four-inch pot. I just put them on that. Right. I never Which, did that in between snacks. Yeah, I mean, it's not to say that you have to do that. You're just going to have a much hardier plant with a thicker stalk, and it's going to be more likely to to thrive. I mean, that being said, I know not everyone has the space or the time to do that. But, yeah. And probably, you know, if you have four sort of un not huge plants versus one, you're probably likely to get just as much fruit off one super healthy plant than four kind of spindly. My mother lives in the woods and she taught me how to garden, gave me my green thumb, and she's lovely, but she always says, I'm going tomatoes this year, Jill. I'm gonna do it. Bring me home seedlings. I'm like, okay, mom, I'll do it, no problem. So I bring them home and I say, put one in each of your big clay pots. And she's like, sure, sure. I come back in August, she's about six in one pot. And she's like, I don't know what's wrong, nothing's happening, you're all tall and spindly. I was like, yes, mom, that's why I said put one in each pot. She's like, I couldn't, I couldn't do it. I wanted to plant all of them. Like, she's like, I'm not getting any fruit. Like, that's exactly why. I was actually you're getting less off six than you would off one. So that's, um, it's, it's hard to think about at this time, and certainly, you know, I don't want to, I probably don't need what is I think 50 Cosmo plants in here. I know. <laughs> don't know why I did that, but I'm probably going to end up having to sort of call a few of those. Um, the other thing I would say is if you are growing in pots, um, since I brought that up, um, I would feed your pot partway through the season. So a little bit when you put it in, mix in some compost or some fertilizer, but then come you know July or end of or beginning of August, do it again because your plant's going to use most of that food to pr produce the plant. And then if you want to produce fruit, then you're going to need another little sort of oomph to help it along there. Broccoli. Yeah, I guess broccoli cabbage is a little bit cold hardy too, so you don't have to wait until May 2-4 weekend to put those out. Um, and greens, yeah, a little bit of both. Yeah. I was just wondering, um, when you transplant after the first two weeks, do you ever use a like potting mix? Because that's what I use. Yeah, so yeah. that's totally fine. So yeah. I would recommend you can use a bit of this, and these ingredients are still useful. But I would mix this with a potting soil or compost right. or both. Some people use all three, so right. they use a little bit of peat moss and vermiculite, and then a potting soil and then compost. Um, but even potting soil will have some nutrients in it that are very valuable for your plant at that stage. So right. again, if you did a bit of a science experiment where you only transplanted into this and wanted to potting soil, you'd probably see the ones with potting soil healthier. Yes. Um, and again, it's not quite as light and fluffy, but the plant doesn't need to push through, mm -hmm. so you'll need to remove that. So if it's potting soil, then you don't necessarily need to add compost, but like it might be nice. Yeah, I mean, again, it's just sort of giving your plant an extra leg up, and it yeah. depends where you get the potting soil from, but often potting soil will have your basic nutrients in it that mm -hmm. the plant will need. So again, your growth is pretty into putting their logo on that stuff these days too, so keep an eye out for that if you're uh, concerned about those kind of things. But um, right. yeah, I mean, again, you don't need to be at home making your own soil mix. It is pretty available at garden stores these days. So I would recommend moving from just this in terms of nutrients, definitely. Even if you're going to use something like this, I would still use the time to kind of help with that. Well, what's a good way to save tomato seeds? Um, saving tomato seeds is both complicated and easy at the same time. Um, so you are waiting until you have beautiful fruit on your plant. And I always joke, you know, the one that you most want to bite into and eat is the one that you should probably save seed from. And there's two methods. There's sort of like the beginner easy method where you could slice it open and you know, I'm sure everyone see seeds come out on their cutting board. So you can set them aside um, and they will dry on a paper towel or, or something like that. Um, you may find that doesn't always work perfectly. So what I actually do is ferment my tomato seeds. So I squeeze out the seed and the, the technical term is gook, I'm sure, into a jar like this. Um, I usually do a couple of each sort of type. Um, and then you let it ferment for four, or five, maybe six days. It'll get this like frothy, moldy head on it. And then when you add water, you'll see like the good seeds sink and the mold and any seeds that aren't viable float. Then you pour off the mold. Um, I usually do that a couple times, so add water until it's clear, 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 and all you see is tomato seeds and water. Then strain it through like a sieve or anything that the seeds won't fall through. And then you can set them aside to dry. 
Um, the reason why I do that is because, you know that jelly coat that's on um, tomato seeds? It separates that so that it won't worry about them rotting over the winter. And also it will kill any disease that's living in tomatoes. So particularly when I sell tomato seeds everywhere, I really don't want to be responsible for spreading disease <laughs> everywhere. So I think... Um, but the good thing about that is, like, you know, I brought some of this. This is my lettuce seed that I collected last year. I haven't sold any of it because I haven't had time to clean it. And it's actually quite not super fun process. I'm usually sitting in my apartment being like, the seed's heavy and it sinks. And so if you use air, the chaff will blow away. But tomatoes, once you've done that fermenting thing, then they're clean. You just put them aside, store them somewhere dark and cool, and you don't even have to think about them again. So it's a bit more work at the time, but then it is sort of. Um, and I brought a few cards from my business, um, and there's tons of information about seed saving and seed starting as well. So if you're interested, you're welcome to take one of those for step by step for all the different seeds that you can save. I, I can call you when I have my stunt. Yeah, I'm yeah, very interested by that. Because I've heard people say for sure they get that big and then die because of yeah, everything off. Yeah, they didn't die. They didn't die. die. It just stopped. So maybe it was a. Uh, yeah, I mean, admittedly, I found some in my garden in September that are still that big, but I didn't get around to taking out of these tiny pots. But if you did move them into a bigger one, yeah, it does seem they should have taken strange. Yeah. They weren't root bound, but yeah. Um, That's try a history for the ages. Don't Definitely try again. again. Try again. <laughs> I have cherry tomatoes in a, in, a, in a plant or in a pot, and the, the first year they were really, really good. They came out, or they grew really well. The second year, uh, they, they, they did sort of like that. They grew sort of, and then the, they began to look kind of funny. And they still produced some fruit, but the leaves sort of started to shrivel up. OK. And um, I'm wondering if maybe it was the soil. I might have used some of the same soil you know, from the previous year right. or something. Which know. is totally fine, but I would add some more nutrients yeah. in it, because they often have probably depleted the soil yeah. to get to that healthy stage. Guess, yeah. Um, and drainage too is really key for that, so sometimes if things are getting overwatered, they will wilt a little bit. Um, if you notice plants dying from the bottom up, yellowing and getting spots on their leaves, that's blight. And if you notice that in pots, I would ditch that soil and start fresh. Um, just because it's an organism that lives in your soil. If you're in a garden, you don't have that same option. Like I have blight in my garden every year and I don't really have the choice to sort of pull out all the soil, but if it's in a pot, it's easier to do. But yeah, just add, you know, even leaf compost or the um, Ecology Park has mushroom compost, which is super nutrient rich and it's not cheap, but if you just have a few planters on your on your patio, it's worth buying a bucket to just kind of feed through. And you can just top dress too, so July, just take a couple handfuls of compost and put it right on top of the plants and it'll naturally kind of seep in and feed your plant for sure. And big pots, you know, like I have lots of people that grow things in this, and you will see the difference if a plant's in a pot this big versus this big, it will be <coughs> this big versus this big. Yeah. Yeah. the fertilizer you're using, what type do you look at? Push for the fertilizer for your, um, uh, that would be for your food. Yeah, so there's a variety called musky, which maybe is what you're referring to. That's a, an organic fish fertilizer, and it, it's, uh -huh. yeah, it's really great for tomatoes and uh, different fruiting plants, uh -huh. definitely. So again, usually you have to dilute it. So in the case of if you're growing in pots, you could water directly with that. Or sometimes, as I said, the packing the lunch, I've used musky for that before. Uh -huh. So you pour a little bit of the diluted right into the Whole, and then put the plant in and then it's going to kind of give it that head start and then part way through the season if you're sort of like oh plants don't really look like they're doing that great then you can water them again uh, yeah. probably some people do it all the time but I mean it's not overly cheap product so you might not want to water your tomatoes with it every single day or anything but have you ever heard of wardroom casings used as fertilizer? Uh, yeah, they're what some people refer to as black gold. <laughs> um, so that's like if you're doing worm composting in your house, um, which is, I'm not an expert on it, but apparently quite easy to do, and that produces compost that is really high, high in nutrients. So if you had some of that when you transplanted and put some into your pots, I think you would notice a pretty significant uh, increase in growth, yeah. And probably easier than trying to track back into your compost in the back of your backyard when there's still three feet of snow. I don't know, I use it but your plants always come or in ready for use before mine. Right. 
Yeah, I've heard rave reviews about it, and I'm thinking about getting it in mind because, as I said, I live in an apartment building, so it would be very convenient to just have that for reasons of transplanting and things like that. I'm a bit of an ad hoc gardener, so I usually use what I have at hand, but um, something like that is quite valuable if you're, if you're willing to construct a little worm house in your, in your home. We, just a interjector, we did, um, for science, we did a square foot garden last year, okay. we did three of them, so we had little experiments happening in each one, and we, he, <laughs> went out and got every worm he could possibly find, and they went in one, oh. and they stayed in that one, and you know what, it actually did do a lot better yeah. than the other ones. And we started with all fresh, like the, the three soils, and mm -hmm. you know, like the mixtures, like what you're saying there, in our soils, we had really nice, because we're in a potty pool and there was sand there. So we had good soil to start with, yeah. and the worms seemed to make a difference. Like. <laughs> and in, in your ground, they have sort of double duty that they're kind of creating airflow yeah. passages, and so your plants have more room for roots to spread out and yeah. things like that. Because I didn't like the idea of doing that. Like, you just take a rubber band bin, kind of put it under your sink with newspaper. Yeah, worms and everything. I just couldn't get my mind. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> worms are so much for science. Yeah, that's, that's fair for sure, especially in your kitchen like that. <laughs> yes, worms are your friends in the garden, and if you have a new garden and you see worms in it, then that's definitely a good song. It's a good place to plant, definitely. Okay. Does anyone have any other questions? Well, I think that's pretty much my spiel about seed starting, and I hope that um, if you haven't already started some seeds, that you will go forth and do so, and as I said, if you want to start peppers, I would do it sooner than later, but other things, you still have a little bit of time for, for sure. Um, and my garden network cards, postcards are here, so you can always give me a call or send me an email, there's lots of info on our website as well. Are they, they're green up. Yeah, they're green up. I have some with your me with me tonight if anyone's interested. Um, but they're at Green Up and at uh, Avant Garden as well. Okay. Oh sure, yeah.